I want you to imagine that you're walking along a beach in ancient Greece, and you look up at the beautiful limestone cliffs next to you, and you see something odd. You see a shape, and you walk over to investigate, and it looks like this. You notice that it has a spiral pattern, a lot like a seashell. And it has a conical shape, a lot like a seashell. And it might even have a hole in the bottom for an animal to crawl inside, like animals might crawl inside a seashell. <laughs> so what do you think this is? That's right. It's the condensation of an invisible fiery vapor within the Earth. <laughs> And if that leap in logic makes sense to you, congratulations, you think just like Aristotle, who was wrong about everything. <laughs> now, what do I mean when I say Aristotle, the scientist, was wrong about everything? Let's just look through a few quick examples here. So Aristotle somewhat famously believed that the most common element in the universe wasn't something that you could see or touch or smell or taste. It was a magical, invisible substance called ether. And floating through the ether, of course, were all of the celestial objects which orbited the center of the universe, which of course was Earth. And he had all of these amazing ideas in his heart, because that's where the center of cognition was, the brain was just a cooling organ that quelled the fires that burned in the hearts of men. <laughs> and he would say all of these ideas out loud using his voice, the tone of which comes from testicles. And he was interested in reproductive organs. In fact, he looked at reproductive organs in a lot of animals, but he couldn't find reproductive organs in eels. And so he was like, well, they don't have gonads. Therefore, they're going to go extinct in a couple of years. <laughs> he went even farther with his investigation of animals. A lot of people call him the godfather of taxonomy. And he took the entire animal kingdom and split it into two distinct groups. There were animals with blood, that would be things like humans, birds, snakes, things like that. And then there were animals without blood, which were things like insects, sharks, figs, and iron. <laughs> Again, after having all of these amazing ideas in his heart, Maybe you wanted to relax. Maybe you wanted to kick back and relax, maybe with a lady friend. But ah, uh, ah, uh, Aristotle knew. Aristotle knew, as do all of us, that too much sex leads to sunken eyes because semen drains matter from the brain. <laughs> so these are some of the sillier ideas that Aristotle got wrong, but he also wrote some pretty reprehensible things in his science documents, uh, particularly on the subjects of slavery and women. And I'm not going to get into everything he got wrong. I invite you to look into it yourself or to ask me afterwards just to say he was wrong about everything. So 14 centuries after Aristotle had died, there was a brilliant and a very influential Persian scientist named Ibn Sina, and he was looking back through a lot of Aristotle's work. And he said, fossils don't form spontaneously within the earth from a condensing vapor. That's silly. Fossils grow spontaneously within the earth from a condensing liquid. This just shows how deep-rooted Aristotle's ideas were and how widespread they were. But fortunately, working around the same time, but thousands of miles away, there was another brilliant scientist who was wildly underappreciated named Shen Kuo. And Shen Kuo was walking through the woods in central China when he came across the scar left in the landscape by a tremendous landslide. And within the rock face, Kuo saw a bunch of fossils that looked a lot like bamboo. And Kuo began to think, well, wait a minute, maybe there's some relationship between the fossil bamboo and living bamboo. And more than that, 
Kuo realized that the climate in central China couldn't support bamboo at all, which suggested that the climate must have changed over time. Kuo's ideas were being had in 1080, which is really, really long ago, and he was really excited about them and wanted to share them with everyone. And as he did, he was drawn into a military conflict, ousted from a seat of political power, placed under government-sanctioned probation before eventually falling ill and dying. <laughs> Let's fast forward 500 years more. We're now close to two millennia after Aristotle has died, where we meet a Swiss scientist named Conrad Gessner. And Conrad Gessner loved fossils. I mean, he loved them ever since he was a kid, and he would go on to collect thousands of them over his lifetime, and he would take meticulous notes. He would note, the, he would describe them, he would make measurements, and he would draw an illustration for each and every one of them. Eventually, in 1565, he publishes a four-volume masterpiece of these descriptions, but he knew he wasn't done. Describing the fossils wasn't enough. He had to know where the fossils came from. But unfortunately for Gessner, geology wasn't exactly the highest paying profession in the mid 1500s. So to make ends meet, he also trained as a physician. Shortly after he publishes his four volume masterpiece, he walks down the street, treats a local patient, promptly catches plague and drops dead. The curse of Aristotle strikes again a hundred years later, this time with an English scientist named Robert Hooke. And Robert Hooke was much more of a botanist. In fact, he really loved studying fossilized trees and fossilized wood, and he would compare that to samples of living wood under this newfangled thing called a microscope. And he would compare the two under the microscope. He said, wow, these two look a lot alike. There must be some relationship. In fact, I'm willing to bet that fossils are the remnants of once living trees, and somehow the living wood transforms into a rock over time. And Hook was really excited about this idea. But unfortunately for him, there was another well-known scientist of the day who hated Hook. And in fact, this other well-known scientist was very vocal, saying, this guy's full of crap, you shouldn't believe anything he says, and he actually promotes Hook's main rival and effectively banishes all of Hook's work on fossils to total obscurity. Hook abandoned his work shortly thereafter. <laughs> By the way, that well-known scientist was none other than Sir Isaac Newton. Gravity was cool, though. <laughs> so right around the same time that Hooke was abandoning his work on fossils, a Danish scientist named Nicolas Steno went on vacation and decided that this was a great time to dissect a shark's head. Because apparently that's something people did for kicks in 1665. <laughs> And as he was dissecting the shark's head, he was looking at the teeth and he said, wow, these teeth look a lot like fossil teeth that I've seen. And so we began to compare the two and he said, not only do they look identical, there's clearly some relationship between them. These teeth are just too similar. But he also saw in the fossil teeth the same signs of wear and tear and decay, little chips and cracks and breaks, which suggested to Steno, there's no way that these things could have formed spontaneously within the ground. He's still wrestling with that idea. He said there's no way they could have formed in the ground because if they did, where did all the wear and tear and decay come from? So Steno was right there, but before he could finish drawing that connection between fossils and once living things, he converted from Protestantism to Catholicism and abandoned his work to become a priest. Which brings us at long last to the year 1818, the year the curse of Aristotle was finally broken. And it was broken by the Frenchiest of men, whose name was Jean Leopold Nicolas Frédéric Cuvier. <laughs> Better known to his friends as Georges. 
And Georges Cuvier was a naturalist who, like his companions before him, absolutely loved fossils. And in his journeys to the Americas, he had actually discovered gigantic leg bone fossils. And he was like, wow, these look a lot like elephant bones. And Cuvier knew these are just too similar. There are too many weird similarities. These have to be the remnants of a living animal at some point. But Cuvier also knew there were no elephants in the Americas. There was nothing that looked like an elephant in the Americas, which suggested to him that there must have been some animal that he called a mastodon that must have at one point been there and had since gone extinct. When Cuvier publishes these ideas in 1818, it was really the final nail in the coffin of Aristotle's idea that fossils grow spontaneously within the ground. But more than that, Cuvier's ideas that extinction was even possible began to revolutionize the whole field of paleontology. But there's a footnote to our story. Because for all of his work on fossils and mastodons and extinction, in his later years, Cuvier became far better known for vehemently opposing the theory of evolution. And Cuvier would rail against evolution in his papers and publicly, and he would try to get as much evidence as he possibly could to say evolution is not a thing. And what was he looking at? Well, he would dig through his own observations. He'd looked at a lot of skeletons and, and made notes on anatomy, and he could even look back at some of Gessner's work. And he would compare observations of modern animals to observations made of ancient animals. And he was able to say, well, look, cats haven't changed in a couple thousand years. Clearly, evolution's not a thing. So like I said, Cuvier could make his own observations for modern animals. But whose observations of ancient animals was he using to rail against evolution? <laughs> Whose name was he dropping in his papers and in his talks? Who did he uphold as a bastion of taxonomy and biology to rail against evolution? It was fucking Aristotle. <laughs> so the story of fossils shows us just how hard it can be to overthrow an idea. And the story of fossils also shows us how we can become so ingrained in these ideas that are hard to kick, as ridiculous as they might seem. So thank you, Aristotle. Thanks for making it so hard to overcome these ideas. Thanks for giving us so many loony ideas. But more than anything, thanks for being, and say it with me now, wrong about everything. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>